I want to share an intensely practical message with you. If you want to follow this in an actual Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 17, and you will find message notes and discussion questions that you can use for further studies um, or in your connect groups. You'll find those online. You go to Connect with God, click on uh, Messages, and it'll bring up uh, those message notes for you. The title of the message is Engage Your Filter. And I'm picking this up from a story in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, uh, where Paul and his team, they're on their missionary journey. They're going around to various cities. They land in a place called Thessalonica, which is in Greece. And what Paul did when he visited a city was he would go straight to the local synagogue and he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, Sabbath after Sabbath, showing them. And remember, the Scriptures is not our Bible today. Well, not all of it, because the New Testament was being written at that time, right? So when it talks about him reasoning with them from the Scriptures, it's talking about what the Jews call the Tanakh, and what we Christians often refer to as the Old Testament. That was the Bible of the first century, and so he's reasoning with them and he's showing them from the Scriptures that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Christ. And then some of them agree, but then some of them disagree. And some of the Jews that disagree then get angry. And it tells us that they got some unsavory characters together to start protesting. And they caused a ruckus in Thessalonica, which could have led to uh, Paul and Timothy and Silas and others um, being persecuted and severely hurt. And so they left. And I love that because the, what we see in the, in the New Testament is not Christians with a persecution complex. They didn't stay there and going, oh, we want to be beaten up for Jesus. You know what I mean? They left and they went a little while uh, inland uh, to a, little, a smaller town called Berea. And as soon as they got there, Paul opened the Scriptures again in the synagogue and started sharing that Jesus Christ is the promised Jewish Messiah. And it tells us, Luke tells us there in, in Acts chapter 17, that the, the people, the, the Jewish people particularly in Berea were more noble-minded or more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica because they listened to Paul. They then searched the Scriptures to find out whether Paul was right or wrong. They found that he was right. And as a result, they committed their lives to Jesus Christ. But then... He tells us that some of the, uh, the people from Thessalonica heard that Paul had gone to Berea, and so they sent agitators there. So once again, Paul didn't stay. Some of the believers got him to the coast and um, got him on a ship, and they sailed together down to Athens. And Paul then said to those people who escorted him, go back to Berea and tell Timothy and Silas and my team to meet me in Athens. And so that's the background to this story. Um, I went on to Google Maps and I've discovered that you can drive these days from Berea to Athens in five hours and 19 minutes. Uh, it would have taken Paul longer, probably, uh, to get there by ship. And so I want us to focus on, on verse, seven, uh, verse 16 this morning. You can skip the first part of the notes because I've kind of told you um, what, that, what that is. So we'll go straight to verse 16. If you can pop that up uh, on the screen, that would be wonderful. There it is. Okay, so while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Pause and think about that for a moment, okay? So he's landed in Athens and he's having a walk. He's wandering around the city of Athens and he sees that there is idolatry everywhere and it, and it cut him. He was greatly distressed by it. The Greek word is parent, uh, parozuno. Parozuno. That'd be a good trivia night question. Not. So it's made up of two Greek words, para, which means alongside, and oxus, which means a sharp edge. So para, we talk about para church organizations. For example, like World Vision or Compassion, um, organizations that are, they're not the church, but they are called alongside the church to assist the church in its mission. In many ways, Bayside Community Care is a para church organization. It's a charity that is 
run by the board of Bayside Church and, and a staff member of Bayside Church, but it's called alongside our church to help us as a church express the heart of Jesus toward those who are poor and struggling in our community and beyond. And so para is alongside, oxus is a sharp edge. And so it's a very um, uh, graphic kind of a word. Can you imagine what it's like? And you've probably experienced this over the years, using a sharp knife and then it slips and it goes alongside your finger, at which point you say, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> or similar words, yeah? It's a sharp edge and, and it means to be cut deeply. We know what this is like. Paul was walking around Athens. He looked at all of this idol worship and he was deeply cut. He was literally jabbed in his emotions by the idolatry that he witnessed. It got to him and it irritated and angered him. And my question is, and I know the answer, have you ever felt that way about something? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. We know what that's like. When someone says something or does something and we feel or we see something that's happening in the world around us and we feel deeply cut, we feel jabbed deep within. And so Paul's emotional reaction to idolatry in Athens was authentic and it was relatable. It reminds us that our emotions, even the negative ones, are part of our God-given humanity. Every single human being is made in the image of God. Your emotions aren't wrong. They're fine. What Paul felt, what we feel is not wrong. When something happens and you feel angry or hurt or provoked or cut, please don't deny how you feel. Embrace it. Think about it. But don't react. And that's the key. We need to learn to engage our filter this is not a sign of weakness, but a demonstration of your strength and control, self-control over your emotions. And we'll see how Paul did that in just a moment. The Olympics finished tonight. Who's enjoyed the Olympics? Yeah, it's been some amazing sport. I, I love um, the gymnastics. I absolutely love watching the gym. I think they're just amazing. And there was a synchronized, I've, I've always, I've got to confess, always bagged out on synchronized swimming because it's like, okay. And I've often wondered if one synchronized swimmer drowns, do they all follow? <laughs> Just a question. But there was one, there was one group that they, they dived in. Did anyone see it? The diving in and then this incredibly entertaining um, choreographed piece underwater and above water. I mean, it was absolutely, absolutely incredible. So some wonderful sport, but I'm sure unless you've been living under a rock over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of outrage about a couple of things. Anyone? Yeah? Okay. So um, I, I took a break during my long service leave. I took a complete break from social media. Um, and so it was wonderful. I didn't, I didn't engage. I didn't look at anything. But Monday of last week, which was the day after the opening ceremony, I went onto Facebook for the first time in seven weeks and I saw it all lit up with outrage. And it was lit up with outrage because of a particular scene in the opening ceremony um, of, uh, that, that people thought was a mockery of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper painting, yeah? And, of course, it made it worse for the outraged people because it happened to be drag queens. Now, uh, Thomas Jolly, who's the artistic director of the opening ceremony, I read some stuff that he put together. He actually laid out eight different vignettes to, um, to creatively, artistically portray the Olympics and what he viewed as the main parts of uh, French... Uh, culture and history. And so he put the two together. When it comes to this scene, what he actually based it on was not Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. It was based on um, Jan, uh, Jan van Baylut's painting, The Feast of the Gods. And we've got a, a photo of this that we could put up for you. That's The Feast of the Gods that Jan van Baylut painted, and that was finished in 1635. 
But you can see as you're looking at that, that it does look an awful lot like the Last Supper as well, yeah? Okay, so I understand why people thought that that scene could be mocking the Last Supper. Now, the reason it looks like the Last Supper is that Jan van Billiot used Da Vinci's painting for his inspiration. So Da Vinci's painting, if we can look at that now, you can see the similarities, right? It's not completely the same. I think, I think Da Vinci's one is nicer, personally. But Da Vinci finished his in 1498, and then Jan van Bayert um, painted his 130 years later. And so he used that for inspiration. But I just think it's a shame that Christian people in particular didn't engage their th filter and discovered the facts before they took to social media and vomited outrage everywhere. It's not wrong to be outraged. It's okay to be outraged, but we need to get our facts straight first. Can I have an amen? All right. So what we also need to understand that da Vinci's artistic interpretation is just that, okay? That painting that you're having a look at now, which of course is world-renowned and it is stunning, it is beautiful, put together, is Leonardo da Vinci's take on an event that happened 1,400 years before his time. I'm going to tell you, this is an artist's impression. The Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples looked nothing like that. It's got to say. Now, I told a joke here about it a few months ago, and it got a very mediocre response, I've got to say. And so I, I use it again this morning, hesitantly, just to see if it genuinely is not funny. So Peter and, uh, sorry, Jesus and the disciples walk into a restaurant and Peter asks for a table for 26. And the waiter looks at him and says, but there's only 13 of you. And Peter said, yes, we all want to sit on one side. So that is actually genuinely not a funny joke. <laughs> because even that statement got more of a laughter. There was this awkward pause, wasn't it? You were just sitting there going, I know he wants us to laugh but it isn't funny, and so we're not going to. So that's it. I promise I will never, ever use that joke again, because when I read it for the first time, I laughed out loud because I thought it was hilarious, And then, but obviously it is not. It was funnier in my own mind. And so the painting that we're looking at right now is an interpretation. It is, it is, is, da Vinci was looking through the eyes of the culture of the 1400s, where people sat around tables on chairs, they didn't do that in the first century. The tables would have been low, and this still happens in, in some Middle Eastern countries even to this day, where there are low tables with cushions around, and, and they would lean on their left elbow and kind of be uh, kind of zigzagged around or, you know, all, all, all kind of around the table, leaning on their left elbow. Now, I don't know what left-handed people did in the first century. It would be really, oh, well, hello. <laughs> I guess we're going to be talking together all dinner time. So, and they would, they would take the food off the table with their right hand. That's, that's what they did back in those days. So, so this painting is beautiful, but it's not accurate. But it doesn't need to be accurate. It's art, right? It's an artist's impression of an event that happened 1,400 years previously. We as Christians are not called to defend a work of art. We don't need to be outraged about it. And I, I went online and tell you, there are over 500 different depictions of the Last Supper, including one by Bart Simpson. <laughs> and there was never any outrage about that that I can remember. Now, I didn't watch the entire opening ceremony. That's my confession today. But the bits that I have seen, I got to tell you, the most inspiring thing I saw was Celine Dion's song. Man, I watched it again during the week. And, and if you know any of Celine's backstory, she got diagnosed a few years ago uh, with an incurable disease. It's called Stiff Person's Syndrome. And her 
muscles can go into spasm. She can, she can be walking along and just fall over. It affects her vocal cords. I mean, how horrible for a, a, a woman who is so talented and given us so many amazing songs over the years. And so the very fact that she was there standing under the Eiffel Tower in the pouring rain and belting out the most amazing French song, I mean, it was stunning. I watched, I had goosebumps. I'm like, this is incredible. Like, go Celine, right? Amazing. And then I looked online and there's all these people going, ah, she lip synced it. I'm like, oh, give me a break, seriously. And then, of course, we saw the outrage over the Algerian boxer, Emane Khalif. And I realised that at the moment, the, and, and, and Christians who buy into this as well, in, in culture wars, and I've watched it now for decades, and, and, and if you're a culture warrior, what you do is you, you constantly have to find a new thing to be outraged about. Always. you just got to live in outrage. There are whole... Christian ministries that are aimed at keeping a percentage of the Christian population frequently and constantly outraged about something. At the moment, it's anything to do with transgender people. I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, and, and I know it's a nuanced thing and transgender people in sport, and hey, that's way beyond my pay grade. Every sporting code has the responsibility to make, th make sure things are as fair as possible for all the people who compete, right? But when we start to pick on a minority group within a minority group and do it in the name of Jesus, we are not reflecting the nature of the Jesus that we read about in the pages of our Bibles, And people got outraged about this because they've already built into a culture, bought into a culture war, and, and, and they jumped to conclusions that Amane Khalif was a trans woman and that he shouldn't be competing in that. I'm going to tell you. So she isn't, right? She was born a woman. She's been raised as a woman. She travels on a female passport. Where she comes from in Algeria, it's illegal to be transgender. You can't transition there. She's just trained very, very hard. Now, I know that there is possibility there that maybe she's intersex, DSD it's called these days, and that's a whole nuanced thing as well, and scientists are still investigating all that that means. Again, from a Christian point of view, our hearts should be full of compassion. What must it be like to be born with some sort of confusion in your chromosomes, in your genitalia, all of that sort of thing. I was reading a fascinating article about it yesterday on BBC News app, and uh, they have an organisation connected with the BBC called BBC Verify, and I'll post it on, on my Facebook page so you can read it. It's absolutely fascinating what scientists are finding out about this at the moment. And so we need to just take a pause. We need to kick back. And just say, okay, so maybe I'm outraged about something, but I'm going to engage my filter before I start venting. I'm going to find out some of the facts before I go online and make an idiot out of myself. People felt outraged. They felt angry, hurt, provoked, and then they reacted. They didn't engage their filter. And as a result, the message that Christians have given to the world over the past two weeks is that we are easily offended, that we want to have everything our way and want anything we disagree with to be cancelled, you know, just like Jesus. We bang on about cancel culture and freedom of speech, but then act in a way that attempts to restrict anything or anyone that we disagree with. When we act like this, we appear hypocritical, selfish, entitled, and anything but like Jesus. We must remember that the church's central message to the world is the gospel. It's good news. But our outrage inevitably clouds this message. People hear anything but good news from us. They roll their eyes and take another step away from a God who loves them and has moved heaven and earth to reconcile them to himself. 
And that's why my heart aches. I was outraged about the outrage, personally. Let's have a look at Paul's words to the Corinthian church just while we're on this, and then I'm going to get back to the filter in Acts chapter 17. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Well, verse 19 tells us, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Let's just spend a couple of minutes on this. This is really important because what Paul is talking about here is the very heart of the Christian church. This is, this is the purpose for which God was born into the human race in the person of Jesus Christ. And anything that clouds this message is actually an enemy of the gospel. God reconciled us, brought us back into relationship with himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I have had so many people say to me over the years, Pastor Rob, I'm trying to find out what my ministry is. Well, here it is. We all have the ministry of reconciliation. And it tells us in verse 19 what that ministry is, that God was reconciling the world. Now, the world there means everybody. In other words, no one's left out. Everyone, everyone that was alive in Paul's day and before, everyone that's been alive afterwards, everyone who's alive now, and everyone who will be born in the future has been reconciled to God, according to Paul, through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. And then it talks about how God did this. Um, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Why is it that so many followers of Jesus have become sin counters? God didn't count sin. He dealt with it. He brought forgiveness. I love the, I said, you met the blue guy on the controversial scene on the opening ceremony, the blue guy who's actually a depiction of the Greek god Dionysus. Um, I saw an interview with him during the week. He's, he's very funny. And uh, uh, the, the interviewer said to him, so, you know, a lot of Christians are outraged about, about your depiction um, and, and that opening scene and everything. And he said, well, he said, I, I actually, I'm going to try and do the French accent, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to slip into Indian for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll just speak in my normal accent <laughs> as well. <laughs> bizarre what goes on in my head. He said, um, what I know about Christianity is that it is centered around forgiveness. So I hope that anyone that was offended by what I did will forgive me. I'm like, oh my goodness, mate, you are more Christian than the Christians. <laughs> and then the next question was, did you get all the blue dye off? And he said, almost. <laughs> and his belly button was still blue. <laughs> it, was, it was just beautiful. And so God was in reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin sins against them. And then the next line, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So our ministry and our message to the world is not one of outrage, it's good news. And anything that we do or say that works against the good news of the gospel is an enemy of the gospel. I hope you can tell I feel rather passionately about this. And then the last line, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Wow, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is a person who represents their home country on foreign soil. The New Testament tells me that we are citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are strangers and pilgrims on this planet. We're just passing through. And while we're here, we are ambassadors. We're representatives of heaven. We're supposed to be fulfilling the Lord's prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And our message is the good news that God loves you and has dealt with your sin, just as that beautiful 
guy so uh, magnificently put, it's all about forgiveness. God's already forgiven you. He's dealt with your sin in Jesus Christ. He didn't sit there counting it. We're not going to count it either. And that's good news. That's attractive. If, if the world would hear this message, rather than all our foaming and outrage and frothing about all the stuff that we don't like, maybe, just maybe, more people would be taking a step toward Jesus rather than rolling their eyes and going, yeah, we thought so, the Christians are at it again. Amen. Having said all that, let's go back to Acts chapter 17 and see how Paul engaged his filter. Acts 17, we're going to pick it up at verse 17. So he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. I want you to notice that, Paul's message. It wasn't about, oh, we've been wandering around Athens. and you People got idols everywhere. Catch yourselves on. No, no, no. He was sharing the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was a hilltop um, near Athens where philosophers debated. It was also where city officials held trials for murder and crimes against public order. So they took Paul there. And picking it up at verse 19. Then they took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they, what they mean. And then Luke adds in brackets here, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there at the Areopagus spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Wow, how things have changed. We don't do it at the Areopagus anymore, but we do do it on social media. Now, see how Paul engages his filter. Remember, as he walked around Athens, he was angry, distressed, and irritated by all the idols that he saw. How did he communicate with his hearers? Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. Wow. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. See what Paul did? Uh, the words very religious come across in English as slightly judgmental, but they're not that way in the original. The, the, they would actually be better, better translated as, I see that you are respectful of the divine. Beautiful. And so he engaged his filter. Yeah, I'm outraged by stuff. What am I going to do? I'm going to engage my filter, and then I'm standing before these people, and I'm going to talk to them kindly, gently, I, I, I see that you're deeply respectful of the divine. While I walked around Athens, I saw your objects of worship. Not, well, I was walking around Athens before I got here and, oh my goodness, flipping idols everywhere. What's wrong with you people? Outrage, outrage, disrespect. He engaged his filter and then he goes on, you read the right, last part of Acts chapter 17, which is this stunning story where he actually draws on, on Athenian history from 600 years before, um, and he talks to them about this altar to the unknown God, and then he tells them who this unknown God is and shares the good news of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely wonderful. We've got to think about these things when we're engaging in life. It's okay to feel outraged or cut or jabbed or whatever, but we need to engage our filter before we respond in every situation of life. The Athenians' idolatry angered Paul, but he engaged his filter and spoke with them respectfully. Luke recorded this story for a purpose, and one of those purposes was to show us how we can courteously interact in every sphere of life. 
Paul engaged his listeners and did not antagonize them. He had an opinion about idols, but was able to discuss it respectfully. Can we do the same? And as I say, this works in every part of life when you're at work. For example, and it doesn't matter what workplace you are in, you're going to find someone there annoying. It doesn't matter. You can leave your workplace and go somewhere. I've seen the same happen in church life over 32 plus years, the number of people who come and go, and people get offended and they go to another church thinking, I'm not going to be offended there. I won't find anybody annoying. And you know what? We all need to realize that for some people, we are the person that is annoying. Hello? And so you're at work. And someone says something or does something and you feel cut by it. Pause. Engage your filter before you respond. Go out, have a walk. Do something. Same if you get an email or a text message. I found this to be very therapeutic over the years. When you get an email and you feel jabbed or cut by it, I will respond but not send it. I'll, I'll, I'll type up an email response or a text message. It's amazing how fast you can type when you feel angry. Two thumbs. I'm, I'm a two-finger typer, but I can type really fast with two fingers. And if I'm feeling a little jabbed or cut, I can go even faster than normal. <laughs> Note to self, don't put the person's email address in the to section. So you, you write the email and then you put it in your drafts folder for at least a day. You'll go back to it a day later. Nine times out of 10, you will delete the email. One time out of 10, you will rewrite the email. And even when you've rewritten it, it's always a wise thing to get at least one other person to look at your response and to give you some feedback. I do that with my blog every week. I write a blog, and particularly if it's on a controversial topic, um, which sometimes it is, <laughs> at least two people will read it, right? Sandra will read it, and Jimmy will read it. And I love the fact that over the years, they have sent it back to me and said, Pastor Rob, I think this needs to be changed. This is coming across a bit too strong. Whatever have you thought about? And I so value that feedback because then I can do a little rewrite and maybe soften some of the edges. And so what you see is something that has been worked on and crafted, and I've been accountable to other people on my team before it's released into public. I encourage you to do the same, because that's all about engaging our filter. So important. Now, some helpful filters from the Scriptures, and then I'm going to finish. Filter number one, the golden rule. Jesus taught this in Matthew 7, 12, but it wasn't new to him. In fact, it was 2,000 years older than Jesus. The first time the golden rule uh, was seen in humanity, it was in an ancient Egyptian play called The Eloquent Peasant. It dates around 1850 BC. And then in the 1400s, uh, Judaism invited it into the Old Testament, into the Tanakh. And so what Jesus is quoting here is a truth that had been buzzing around for about 2,000 years before he arrived. This truth, by the way, is featured in the 12 major world religions today. The golden rule. So, in everything. Does that leave anything out? <laughs> in everything. Do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. I love that statement, the way of the saying, summing up the law and the prophets, is, that's a, it's, a, it's to say, this summarizes the entire Bible. If you were to take all of Scripture and put it into one line, this is what it would be. Do to others, um, the, the King James says, do unto others, and I heard someone say, they thought it said, do one to others before they do one to you, <laughs> and say, that's not what Jesus is teaching do to treat others the way you'd like to be treated. This is a wonderful filter. I use this several times every week. 
when, when I'm about to react in some way, I will stop, I will pause, and I think, okay, so if this was me, how would I like to be treated in this given circumstance? And that helps me to think through, and then invariably my response or my behavior will change completely to that person as a result of that reflection. It's a great filter, the golden rule. Second one is the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself, says Paul in Romans 13, 9 and 10. This is found eight times in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Again, that statement says, is saying, if we were to summarize all of scripture in one line, this would be it. And it's very similar to the golden rule. Love your neighbor as if they were you. Again, how would I like to be treated in this situation? I'm going to then act toward that person in that way. When we apply these principles in our interactions, we not only align ourselves with the teaching of Scripture, but also foster a sense of connection and humanity, sorry, connection and unity with our community. And then the final one is the fruit of the Spirit. We find this in Galatians 5, 22, 23. And the Galatians needed to hear this. The Galatians were a violent group of people, about 20,000 of them, several hundred years before Jesus had migrated from Asia, um, southern Asia, through to um, what is now modern-day Turkey in the hill country. They were very tall people, and they were red-headed, red-haired, and they were violent. They took up residence in the mountainous parts of what is now inland Turkey, and they would launch raids from there on all the surrounding areas. They were eventually subdued by the Romans and the Roman Empire. But they had that history of violence. And so there's now this small community of Jesus followers in Galatia, and Paul is writing a letter to them because maybe, just maybe, they still have a vestige of their violent history resident on the inside of them. And so he reminds them the fruit, the product of the Holy Spirit's work in your life is things like this, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They are wonderful qualities, are they not? To reflect on, to help us engage our filter. We're feeling cut, we're feeling angry, we're feeling outraged, okay pause. How am I going to act? How can I act in this situation in a loving way? How can, forbearance, patience, putting up with. How can I act kindly or, or in a good way? How can I be gentle? How can I express self-control in this situation? And one of the ways we do that is by not responding until we feel calm. So that then, however we act, is out of a calm spirit, having thought through. And then you might have a, a really straight conversation with someone, but you're not doing it with, out of anger. You're not doing it because, because you're all stirred up on the outside. You're actually sitting with them and then you say, okay, so I need to be able to have a conversation with you about this event that happened and, and the impact that it had uh, on me. And, and I want to just say to you that it's not okay to speak to me like that. Um, that I would, I'm going to be kind to you, but I would expect you to be kind to me as well. You know, it's a conversation like that, where you're going to be honest and open uh, and straight, but you're doing it from a, from a calm, self-controlled spirit, not an angry one. And so I encourage you uh, in life to pick your battles. Not everything needs to be fought. When you're dealing or, or uh, liaising or just spending time with some people, you need to decide that certain topics are going to be off, off the conversation list. We had to do this during the, during the pandemic when people were getting very divisive and, and you know, believing all sorts of things. And, and I, I, I actually say to people, because they'd, they'd start up about venting about this, that, and the other, about the pandemic and the restrictions and everything, and I say, okay, so there's lots of different views about this at the moment. We're, we're, we're going through a tumultuous time uh, as a planet, as a church, um, and we just need to calm our jets. And how about we talk about things 
other than the pandemic restrictions and conspiracy theories and vaccines and all of that kind of stuff. Because what happens otherwise is, is I, I know people that have fallen out with family members and friends. And they don't even talk to each other anymore because every time they talk, it has to be about this sort of thing. And I've said that to people. Where this, is off the, this is off the agenda. I, I was in um, Bali uh, recently and um, we have some people in there that we're still ministering to and one is a lady who's on death row and uh, I went in to see her and we're sitting down having a chat and, and she just gets off track on all sorts of stuff and I stopped her and I said, okay, I said, I'm here for one hour. That's all I'm allowed to have with you before they ask me to leave. And I said, we are not going to spend the hour talking about American politics. She loves Donald Trump. I, I might feel, I could possibly feel slightly different, but that's not the issue. She doesn't believe in climate change and um, she's an anti-vaxxer, okay? So there's three really controversial topics. So I said to her, I said, oh, we're not going to talk about any of that. We're going to talk about other things. And we did. And at the end of the hour, she gave me a big hug. She said, this has been the best conversation. I said, yeah, I've loved it too. In my mind, I said, yes, because I took control and stopped you foaming on about your favourite topics. But I didn't say that. <laughs> I engaged my filter. <laughs> and so you might like to do that in some of your relationships. And remember this sermon the next time you feel anger or hurt or outrage rise within you. Take a breath, pause and engage your filter. Be kind and respectful and treat others how you want them to treat you. I hope you got something out of that today.